an EMP in, in entrepreneur from NIT, MIT, and a PhD in nutritional biochemistry from Rutgers. He's a fellow in both the American College of Sports Medicine and the American College of Nutrition, and has uh, educated elite level athletes in a variety of sports, including uh, at the United States Olympic Training Centers. He's an author of over 200 publications and 10 books on nutrition and fitness, and his work has been featured in media outlets around the world, including the White House as part of Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign to fight, to fight childhood obesity, and a, and a variety of segments on the famous Dr. Oz's show. Today, uh, Dr. Talbert's uh, 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 talk will, is entitled Palm, uh, phytonutrients in athletes. Dr. Talbot. Thank, thank you, Dr. Sylvester. Thank you. And, and thank you also to the Malaysian Palm Oil Council for inviting me here to speak and to Dr. Sundram. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit. We heard some, some fantastic presentations yesterday about tocotrienols and how they can be antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, uh, uh, neuroprotective, anti-cancer. Um, we have some, we have some, some uh, some slide issues, but maybe we'll be able to work through these. Um, so, so I'm going I'm to switch gears a little bit and talk not, not in, a, in a reductionist way about what just tocotrienols can do. Um, I'm going to talk about what palm fruit in general, the, the, the whole collection of phytonutrients might be able to do in the case of athletes. Um, so we heard the tocotrienol talks yesterday and, and, and earlier this morning. Um, later on today, we'll hear about carotenoids. We'll hear about fatty acids. We'll hear about polyphenolics, um, all derived from this little fruit. And I want to try to give you the perspective in the, in, in the next few minutes that, that this might be the perfect little package of phytonutrients that can help reduce stress, uh, maintain metabolism and help these athletes, not necessarily to run faster and jump higher and throw further, but to bounce back from their training, bounce back from the stress of their training. Uh, throughout my presentation, I'll use the word stress, and I'll be using that as a sort of a catch-all term to refer to psychological stress, physical stress, oxidative stress, inflammatory stress, et cetera, and I'll try to, I'll try to point that out as I, as I, as I go through. Um, so a lot of the work that I do uh, looks at, we look at athletes, we look at, we look at healthy <coughs> subjects, not necessarily disease subjects, and we'll measure a psychological parameter called vigor. Here's the definition of it from, from Western psychology research. Uh, a three-tiered sustained mood state characterized by physical energy, mental acuity, and emotional well-being. All of that wrapped up together is this one psychological parameter called vigor. And the interesting thing about it is that it's, it, 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 it is very closely linked to the biochemistry of the body. So when biochemistry is out of balance, when your cortisol is high, for example, your vigor tends to be low. When you're overoxidized or overinflamed, your vigor tends to be low. And we've been, we've been pretty successful over the last 10 years or so in showing that if we can change that biochemistry, if we can use nutrients to balance inflammation, to balance cortisol, to balance oxidation, to control free radicals, we can improve the psychological outcome. So those are some of the data that I'll, that I'll share with you today. Um, my 14-year-old daughter was duly impressed that I could make what's called a word cloud on the internet. Uh, this is the text from one of my books uh, called The Secret of Vigor. You put all the text in there, and it tells you what, what words are, are predominant. The size of the word is, is, uh, is, is proportional to the amount of times that that word is there. And I use this to show you when we, when we discuss vigor and when we describe vigor to people, what, what is all involved in that. And you can see, uh, you know, when we talk about vigor, there's a lot of talk about biochemistry, there's a lot of talk about balance, there's talk about inflammation, there's talk about sleep, there's talk about glucose and, and antioxidants. Uh, all of those impinge on, on how we feel. When we don't feel so good, uh, the opposite of vigor in Western psychology research is, is burnout. And that's a word, burnout, that has, for whatever reason, has, has crossed over into the public vocabulary. People will talk about being burned out. And that can be the result of their diet. It can be the result of lots of different things. But for some reason, vigor hasn't, hasn't crossed over into the public vocabulary. Um, if we look across uh, other cultures, right? So I'll talk about vigor, but that same concept of vigor from Western psychology is qi in traditional Chinese medicine. It's prana in Ayurveda. Every, every culture has their own word for that feeling of feeling good and being motivated and, 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 and having good mood and having good energy. Life force is another way to describe that. 
So I, I, it, it, you know, when I talk to a room full of, of nutritionists, it's not a big surprise to them that nutrition, either eating poorly or eating well, can change how we feel. This is just a, a quick snapshot of some of the studies that are there to show, you know, and this might sound very simplistic, if you eat a lot of donuts, you're not going to feel good. If you eat more salad and salmon, you'll feel better. And of course, you know, we realize in this audience that there's some, some important biochemical reasons for that, but just to, just to give you perspective that there's a lot of very good data linking that biochemistry to that psychology, linking something in the blood, something in the cell, something in the body to this overall feeling of psychology. And when we don't have that, we feel tired, we feel stressed, we feel depressed, we feel, we feel uh, uh, unmotivated, we feel the opposite of vigor, burnout, as I said before. Um, so I, I'm not going to talk so much about disease states. Um, we've heard, we heard a lot yesterday about uh, uh, the link between some of these nutrients and, 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 and real disease states, cancer and things like that. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus most of my, my, uh, my, my talk on, on, on the feeling of, of, of vigor. But you can see that this affects every single tissue in the body. You know, if we look at stress and uh, uh, blood sugar levels, if we look at stress and memory problems, if we look at stress and, and lipid levels, uh, it, it's, it's just over and over and over again. It's kind of, I joke around with some of the athletes that I work with and, and try to educate them about it being a dominoes game, that if one aspect of your metabolism is out of balance, it's very likely that other aspects of your metabolism are out of balance at the same time. And you know, when we, when we look at that, when we look at somebody biochemically, we very often will see the same biochemical disruptions in uh, an overtrained athlete, in somebody who's psychologically stressed, chronic stress, in somebody who's dieting, in somebody who is sleep deprived, in somebody who is, is, is eating a poor diet. They all share a lot of the same biochemistry. They share the same biochemical disruptions, being over-oxidized, over-inflamed, over-stressed. They share the same psychological outcomes. We might label them differently. We might label it as depression, or we might label it as chronic fatigue, or we might label it as overtraining if it's an athlete situation. But, the, but the, 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 the solution for them, the treatment, so to speak, is exactly the same. If we can restore that biochemical balance, we can help them feel better. We can help them perform better. We can help them, to use the example of an Olympic athlete, we can help them win the gold medal. So it might look like this, oxidative balance, stress hormone balance, inflammatory balance, blood sugar balance, all impinging on that, that overall feeling of, of energy and vitality in the body. Um, so to, to, to reduce it down a little bit more, we can look at free radicals, we can look at cortisol, we can look at cytokines. And in some of the studies that I'll show you towards the end of my presentation, we've looked at these individually and shown a particular degree of improvement in vigor, and then we've looked at them uh, in combination. Um, and, and just as we, we, we saw several presentations yesterday about the, 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 the true synergy of using compounds like tocotrienols along with chemotherapy agents, just to use an example, to show that a subtherapeutic dose of both will give not much of a benefit. But when we combine them, we do see that true synergy and we do get a benefit. We see the same exact thing in our measurements of vigor where we'll get a certain benefit of controlling free radicals, but when we combine that with a cortisol controller, we don't get an additive benefit, we get a true synergistic benefit. And I'll share some of that data with you as we go. Um, so whether you're a, a just a, a sort of a normal person or whether you're an elite level athlete, this isn't how you wanna feel. Uh, in some of, the st some of the screening studies that we've done, pilot studies, we can actually measure an athlete's vigor and predict how they'll do in their competition. If their vigor is low, they might as well not even compete in the race because their performance will be subpar. Um, and so coaches are, are, are coming around to the idea of, of monitoring vigor and monitoring biochemical balance in their athletes to get an idea of, of predicting overtraining before the athlete gets there. Because once they're in that overtraining state, once they've been in that state of over-oxidation, over-inflammation, over-stress for a period of time, we can, if, 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 if we can get them before they reach overtraining, we can, we can keep them from injuring themselves. We can keep them from becoming sick. And of course, we can, we can keep them from, from having poor performance. Because what happens over time is the psychology of it, the, 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 the decrement in their, in their vigor will proceed by several weeks tissue destruction will proceed by several weeks their risk of injury or their risk of illness. You know, so we can, we, we, we can look at neurons and we can, we can show very, very, very visually to a group of athletes or coaches, if you're in a normal stress situation, this is what your tissue would look like. Very healthy, very robust, very um, a, a tissue that would, that would perform optimally. 
whether it's a neuron or a muscle cell or a bone cell, whatever. Um, but then, over time, uh, uh, being in this, in this imbalanced, overstressed state, you, you'll, you'll see a functional impairment, and that'll precede by a few weeks this physical impairment where the tissue will actually become catabolic and start to break down. So we show the neurons because it's, it's very visual for people, not quite as visual as a, as a muscle cell or a bone cell or, 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 or a tendon cross-section. Um, this happens in every single tissue in the body this catabolic effect. It happens in neurons, it happens in muscle cells, it happens in tendons and ligaments and bones and skin and every single tissue except this one. And so this can very often be used as a predictor of an athlete's overtraining. When their performance starts to go down, when they're starting to get aches and pains that they didn't have before, and they're starting to gain weight. We'll see athletes who, are, who have 2% body fat and their body fat goes up to 3% in a particular week, right? I think most of us in here would love to have 3% body fat, but it's, it's, it's the end of the world to an elite level athlete when, when their body fat has gone from 2% to 3% and their performance is going down. And now their, their Achilles, uh, Achilles tendon has a little bit of a tweak or their knee is, is sore. Um, the the, the, the uh, intra-abdominal fat, visceral fat, in a normal stress or a normal inflammation or a normal oxidation situation might look great, but when you're out of balance in any of those areas, you start to gain fat specifically in that visceral fat area, specifically belly fat. It's not fat in your thighs, it's not fat in your, in your gluteal region, it's fat specifically in your belly fat region. And once that fat gets there, um, it, it actually starts to create its own oxidative environment. It creates its own free radicals. It creates its own cytokines. It creates its own, uh, recycles cortisol uh, at, at, a, at a much higher rate. So it's a, it's a very uh, vicious cycle for these athletes to get into. And the solution for them is to short circuit that cycle by controlling their oxidation with, with, with uh, antioxidants, controlling their inflammation with anti-inflammatory nutrients, etc. cetera. Uh, so I'm fond of this quote. A great diet will not make an average athlete great, but an average diet will make a great athlete average. Uh, we see this all the time. You wouldn't, you know, working at the Olympic training centers um, and, and, and lecturing at some of the Olympic training centers around the world, I think you'd be surprised to see how poorly some of our elite level athletes around the world eat. Um, very low intake of brightly colored fruits and vegetables, very low intake of antioxidants and anti-inflammatory nutrients in general. Um, you know, the, uh, elite, level, uh, elite level athlete diets very often look like the general population. Lots of fast food, lots of processed carbohydrates, lots of low nutrient density kinds of foods. And we really, we have to jump over a lot of hurdles to get them to, to, uh, to, to eat the way that we think that they should. Um, so here's, what, here, here's the definition of overtraining um, and, and overreaching. An accumulation of training and or non-training stress resulting in a short-term or a long-term decrement in performance capacity with or without a related physiological or psychological sign or symptom of over overtraining in which restoration of performance capacity may take several days or weeks or months. And I give you that definition to show you that we don't really know what overtraining or overreaching is. We know it when we see it, but it's very hard for us pre to predict unless we're looking at some of, those, some of those markers that I just mentioned to you, biochemistry and, and psychology. Uh, once, it, once it gets there, we can sort of look back in time and say, aha, this is what, this is what uh, uh, these are the factors that led to overtraining in this athlete. So it's very easy to look back in time and say, oh, now we get it. It's very hard to look forward in time and predict it. Um, so you can, you can look at the, you know, the, the, the balance between rest and recovery days. We can look at their, their caloric intake to see if they're in a negative energy state or if they're in a, if they're in a balanced energy state. We can look and we can say, are they, are they eating a diet that is, that is high or low in, in antioxidants, high or low in anti-inflammatory nutrients? Um, so you, know, you get the idea that when we, when we try to look at what an athlete is eating, we try to look at it very holistically instead of, very, uh, instead of in a reductionist way. And I understand that sometimes we need to look in a reductionist way to understand some of the, some of the biochemistry that's going on here. Um, when we look at the balance between training and eating, uh, there's kind of a joke in sport nutrition that there's no such thing as overtraining, there's only under eating. That we should be able to get the athletes to 
eat to the, to the demands of their exercise. Um, and, I'll, and I'll show you a slide in a minute that, uh, that, that there's, some, there's some physiology going on that makes that difficult sometimes. But what we generally see is that you know, performance will go up in response to more training volume or more intensity. But there's a tipping point. There's an optimal point where you can balance your training and your diet to reach that, that gold medal performance or that world record beating, uh, beating performance. But then there's a tipping point where uh, where adding on more volume and more intensity leads to this overtraining state or this undertraining state, and performance starts to go down. Uh, it's very, very difficult in these elite level athletes when they're at this point to, to, to shut them down, to get them to not train harder. And as soon as, they hit, as soon as they hit that tipping point and their performance drops, what do they do? They train harder. They put more stress on their bodies. They sleep less because they're worried about their performance. Their body is becoming more oxidized and, 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 and uh, tissue damage is going down. This is another way to look at the same thing. We want, we want these athletes to be, we want these athletes to be in, a, in a balanced state in terms of calories, in terms of protecting their tissues, in terms of repairing and, and recovering. Um, but they can get into a situation where they have an inadequate diet, not enough calories, not enough antioxidants, not enough anti-inflammatory nutrients, and that leads to that acceleration of tissue damage that can lead to, to, to poor performance and to injury. So how do these athletes eat? Right? We can't tell them to eat the same thing all the time. Here's an example of a 165-pound of um, uh, uh, Ironman world champion athlete that I've worked with, 165 pounds. And the difference between what their total caloric intake looks like over the year, uh, in, in the off-season when, when this athlete is trying to lose weight, my clicker's not working anymore, but you can see uh, 1,765 calories in a weight loss phase of their off-season, all the way to almost doubling their total caloric intake when they're in the middle of their season, you know, September or October coming up to, uh, to uh, you know, a Kona Ironman. A huge, huge change in the volume of calories and, and thus the volume of, of, of nutrients that this athlete's going to be taking. Um, it's difficult sometimes to talk to athletes about gram recommendations, to give them recommendations of grams of carbohydrates per kilogram of body weight, because athletes don't eat grams, right? They eat foods. Uh, so there's some ways, and I'll explain in a moment, um, how, we, how we educate athletes to eat and how we educate them to get those phytonutrients that'll be protective uh, and, and, and restorative in their bodies. So let me, let me address this very quickly. Do athletes need higher levels of phytonutrients? Do they need more anti-inflammatory nutrients? Do they need more antioxidants? Um, there, there's, there's, there's actually quite a bit of controversy in the literature about this. Some studies show clearly there's an increased free radical load in these athletes uh, because of uh, uh, huge increases in oxidative metabolism. Um, there's a loss of some of these nutrients in the body, so you'd, you'd, you would think that we'd, we'd, we'd need to replace those. But not all the supplementation trials have shown, um, have shown a benefit of antioxidant supplementation in athletes. Um, and there could, be, there could be several reasons for that, which I'll, which I'll get into. Um, athletes definitely, especially the elite level athletes, are at risk for marginal intakes. Uh, we see a lot of disordered eating in these elite level athletes. Um, we see not so much at the elite level, we don't so much see anorexia and bulimia and, and fully diagnosed eating disorders. But we do see, uh, especially in the, weight, in, in, in the weight sports, wrestlers, rowers, things like that, gymnasts, uh, we do see a, a use of diuretics and laxatives. We do see elimination diets. We do see some strange dietary practices, um, you know, superstitions. Athletes need to eat a certain, a certain food before every competition. In endurance athletes, triathletes, marathoners, long-distance cyclists, we do see um, a, a very high reliance on uh, uh, refined carbohydrate foods, cereals, pastas, breads, things like that, which are just, just by nature of what they are, low in phytonutrients. Uh, and we see, we see a lot of poor dietary choices that I mentioned before. If you're eating lots and lots of carbohydrates to fuel the demands of your endurance exercise, you're very often not getting the fruits and vegetables that you need. Even those are, those are primarily carbohydrates, they're lower density in terms, of their, in terms of their energy content. So athletes will look to something that gives them more bang for the buck. So this is, what, this, is what new, this is what overtraining looks like in these athletes. Intense training stress, leading to, at least in the short term, a, a, a decrease in their level of hunger. So these athletes very often aren't hungry enough to eat as many calories and as many phytonutrients as they need. Uh, over the long term, they'll actually have an increase in appetite, but that increase tends to be for junk food because of the, because of the cortisol stimulation. Um, so they, they, they reduce their food intake. 
that leads to reduced nutrient availability. That leads to reduced glycogen, elevated free radicals, elevated cytokines, which leads to a, a wide range of things that the athlete doesn't want. Everything from tissue damage to, to fatigue to muscle loss to slower recovery. That can lead to injury and illness. That can, of course, lead to reduced performance, reduced vigor. It can lead to, 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 uh, to depression in certain circumstances. Um, and then this is, a, this is a very vicious cycle that the athletes get themselves into and have, have trouble getting out. Unless we can short circuit that inflammation, unless we can short circuit that oxidation. Uh, and there's, I think there's some ways that we can do that. I'm gonna skip over these next few slides just in the interest of, of time, and I, I certainly don't think I need to explain what a free radical is to this audience. Um, uh, I'll skip over that one too, uh, so I can get to this. Uh, as I was mentioning before, there's no clear consensus about whether these athletes do need additional antioxidants on board. Uh, I'll show you some data uh, in, in, just a, in just a minute that, that I think points to the fact that they do. Uh, the reason for the controversy is that with exercise, there's an upregulation of the production of our, of our endogenous antioxidants, things like uh, SOD, glutathione, catalase. And so uh, there, the, the, there are some who say that that's enough, that we exercise, our bodies uh, produce more of these, of these endogenous antioxidants, and we're good. There's another body of research that suggests that we're not able to, at, at least at this elite level, we're not able to upregulate that production enough. And so there's a gap between what our body can protect us and what we need to get in addition from our diet. And that's, that's, that's more where I, where, where I fall in. Um, so we'll encourage the athletes to get as many of those antioxidants they can from their foods, but many of them will turn to antioxidant supplementation. There have been a number of studies over the last few years showing that there are problems associated with some of the mega dosing that we see going on out there. When we see these gigantic doses of isolated, purified, um, uh, uh, unbalanced antioxidant supplementation, and, and, and alpha tocopherol is a perfect example of that. Uh, we've seen a little bit of that for, for pure ascorbic acid. We see it for pure beta carotene. Uh, and I think that the moral of that story is that what we want to do is pull those athletes back from those high isolation, do high isolation doses, those mega doses of just this antioxidant, just that antioxidant, and focus them back towards certainly the foods. But when we do go to supplementation to, to, to close that gap where we think that, that, that that gap may exist, we want them to be supplementing with a balanced antioxidant, something that contains carotenoids and flavonoids and C and E and the entire antioxidant network. which looks a lot like that. So I'll use this slide and I'll use, a, and I'll use a, um, a simplified version of it to get that point across to athletes and coaches, to show them that there's a reason that they wanna be supplementing with a range of these antioxidants uh, to control oxidation, to control inflammation, which is its own set of a, of, a, of a biochemical cascade. And I think that when we look at that little fruit, that red palm fruit, We've got the whole collection right there. We've got the whole balance. We were actually joking around earlier this week, uh, myself and some of my colleagues who are here, about you know we're hearing some great evidence for tocotrienols on their own. We're hearing some great evidence, we'll hear some great evidence later on today and tomorrow for the carotenoids and for the fatty acids and for the phenolics. But what we were joking about is, Where's the combination extract? Where's the one that has all of that together? That's, what the, that's what's in that fruit. You know, so there's some, there's some rationale for fractioning it all out, but I think there's also some, some rationale for bringing it all back together again and studying that because of the synergy that we're seeing in some of these studies. Uh, we're trying to do this now. Uh, at the company that I work for, Monavi, we've developed an antioxidant scanner that measures flavonoids and carotenoids in skin. And it's, it's absolutely astonishing to me how behavior changes when you scan someone, whether they're an athlete or not, and you can tell them, here's your baseline, this is what your carotenoid flavonoid level looks like right now, now let's put you on a regimen of more fruits and vegetables or, or a balanced antioxidant supplement and see what your number does over the time. And you can see how now these athletes are eating better. Now they're supplementing more appropriately. Now their compliance on their healthy regimen is a lot better. So this is something that we're, that we're gonna be putting into, into some of our studies to, um, to help educate them, but then also to, to, uh, to measure them over time. This is how we educate athletes to eat. Uh, we call it the helping hand. We'll, we'll have them use their hand as a portion control device, and then this, every time you eat using 
your fruits and vegetables to be about this much on your plate, your lean protein about the size of your palm, your concentrated carbohydrates about the size of your fist, your added fat about the size of the circle that your index finger and thumb makes when you make an OK sign, and then whatever metabolic controllers, whatever antioxidant supplements we have on top of that, that ends up being about 500 calories per eating occasion. So we can, we can fairly closely say to an athlete, you need 3,000 calories based on your training needs right now, do this six times a day, or 1,500 calories, do this three times a day. And it allows the athletes to get a balance of those nutrients so that they can control all of these different aspects of biochemistry at the same time. So they can build a meal that controls their cytokines and their cortisol and their free radicals. So I, I want to I wanna share in the, in, in the last five minutes that I have um, just some of the data we've collected over the last 10 years using this, this, uh, this theory of trying to balance biochemistry to change psychology. Um, and in, in most of these studies, are, are, uh, we go into it recruiting people who are healthy but stressed in a particular way. Their cortisol is elevated, their, 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 their free radical damage is elevated, their cytokines are elevated. And we'll follow them for four, usually four to 12 weeks. We've looked at a variety of different adaptogenic supplements. We've looked at different antioxidants, we've looked at different anti-inflammatory kinds, uh, kinds of controllers. And what we generally see is when we, when we deliver a matrix, we get a better overall effect versus looking at any one of those different aspects of biochemistry at the same time. Here's one combination supplement that we've looked at called Recoveries. It's a blend of branched chain amino acids, glutamine, proteolytic enzymes, and antioxidants. We see, when we look at mood state, we see huge benefits in mood state. Tension is going down significantly, vigor is improved significantly, fatigue goes down significantly. Um, we generally see a, 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 a pattern that looks something like this, where the biochemistry changes, C to T ratio, cortisol to testosterone ratio in this particular study, going down after supplementation about 15%. Subjects perceive that in their bodies as a reduction in their overall perception of stress. They're feeling less tension. Uh, and then a, a, a global mood state parameter, a well-being index from the profile of mood states, like global mood state, will improve about the same magnitude as subjective stress, so a 22% improvement. So we'll very often say to these athletes that their biochemistry is driving their behavior. How they're feeling out here in their bodies is driven by something in their bloodstream or in their saliva or in their urine that we're measuring. So we can, we can correlate a change in salivary cortisols to a change in overall mood state. We can, we can subdivide that and show different changes in fatigue and, and vigor and depression and those sorts of measurements. When we look at inflammation, we can look at markers like uh, high sensitivity CRP and we can show a reduction there. We can show an increase in an anabolic parameter. So we can show these athletes that when their inflammation goes down, their body is in a state that's more building and less catabolic, less breakdown. We can show how that links to how they feel in terms of their vigor and their, and their tension. Vigor going up, the 27% change in vigor is pretty substantial. Tension going down. Uh, I felt compelled to put this slide in about Uricoma longifolia or Tong et al. being in Malaysia. We've done several studies on this, uh, on this indigenous root showing that it can reduce cortisol uh, pretty significantly over the course of, of uh, four to eight weeks. It can increase testosterone, free testosterone, not total testosterone. Uh, certainly a benefit to athletes who are, who are able to bounce back from their, from their hard training very quickly. We have looked at branched chain amino acids to show the same thing. Uh, a, 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 a dose of branched chain amino acids lowers cortisol depending on which dose that you give. Um, and then this study that we've just finished, we've looked at one arm taking uricoma longifolia, another arm taking a traditional Chinese remedy called magnolia bark, and we see a drop in cortisol in the magnolia group, a, a, an increase in testosterone after four weeks of supplementation in the uricoma group, and then a change in mood state, exactly what we would, we would predict from the other studies, showing that when we change the biochemistry, we change the psychology, we change how these athletes are feeling. So an 18% improvement in vigor, a 15% improvement in tension, those athletes will do better uh, post-supplementation in their, in their athletic performance compared to pre-supplementation. So to conclude, you know, I think whether we're talking about athletes or we're talking about the general public, we can dial it back and say that the, the, the top reasons for a, a, for a primary care visit, or in the case of an athlete, the top reason for, for finishing last instead of first can be due to stress and fatigue 
and depression. And there's a strong scientific basis for controlling that biochemistry to help these people feel better, primarily with uh, controlling stress outcomes, oxidation outcomes, and inflammatory outcomes. When we look at the change in global mood state that we see and the change in vigor that we see, it's roughly the same magnitude as what you might expect with a, with a, with a pharmaceutical treatment, such as you know, a, a, a Prozac or a Zoloft. Um, and then, this got cut off a little bit, but that theme has proven itself out in several studies in our group, but also several studies in, in, uh, in other laboratories, showing that if we can balance biochemistry, we can, we can get a metabolic effect. We can, we can show that people are losing weight better. We can show that their, that their appetite is better. We can show that their, that their mood state is better. Uh, there's a behavioral effect in our diet studies. People who stay on their diets, are, are, you know, comply with the regimen uh, uh, more closely. Um, if, we look at, um, if we look at our athletic studies, we can see that the athletes are able to stay on their training program, stay on their dietary program, because they're feeling better about it. It feels more real to their bodies, and they're able to, to adhere to it. And then, there, and then there's also, at the end of that, that biochemistry leads to psychology, leads to a physical performance benefit. And we've been able to trace it step by step by step over time. Uh, and I think that, you know, if we look at Again, that palm fruit, it's the whole collection. So we can fraction it out, and we can look at the antioxidant benefits of this, and the antioxidant benefits of that, and the anti-inflammatory benefits of this other fraction, but I'm really excited about diving in and looking at the combined benefit of all of that together uh, in, that, in that matrix of that healthy fruit. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. We, we, we do have time for some questions. Are, are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Cortisol is too high. Right. Uh, how do you get that kind of an athlete? So I've got certain patients of that same state um, to recognize and become compliant in exercising less. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's a, that's a that's a great question because that's the last thing in the world they want to do. They don't want to exercise less, right? So um, we've been in a situation before where we've had very elite level athletes. Well, you know, we'll, so we'll measure. We'll get them on the treadmill in the morning. We'll measure their cortisols. We'll measure their testosterones. We'll, we, you know, we can take blood samples. We, as you well know, we can you can measure their their their, their total antioxidant capacity. You can measure their, their, their free radical loads. And when you show them that and say, look, this is what's happening in your body, it's amazing how those numbers are empowering for the athlete because they can focus on those numbers and say, oh, okay, it's not in my head. It is, it is in their head, but it's being driven by this biochemistry. So you show them that and it's very empowering for them to say, okay, based on that number, now I'll dial it back, or based on that number, now I'll change the way I'm eating. You know, sometimes we have to work through their coaches because, you know, the coach to a lot of those athletes is their, is their shining light, is their God. So it's very much a, it's very much a two-way street to say, hey, coach, don't push them anymore because they're just about to break. And hey, athlete, we know that your performance is going down, but don't push it anymore because you're just about to break. And here, we can predict it based on these numbers. You know, so the more that we can use that, the more I think we can get those athletes to where they want to be, which is top of the podium. One more question. Um, Sean, thank you for that uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, you alluded to the fact that when you take the palm fruit, and uh, in this scenario, we are dealing with uh, three major bioactives, the tocotrienols, the carotenes, and the phenolics. Yes. Okay? The two of these are fat-soluble. The third is water-soluble. The challenge when you extract it, uh, how do you combine this into a single entity yeah. to get the benefits that you want to see uh, from, say, eating a natural palm fruit, if you can at all eat it? So that technological challenge uh, is a big question mark, but yes, I prescribe uh, to the concept that you want to promote. 
Thank you. Right, right, right. and that is, a, that is a, uh, an important technological challenge because, you know, we want to educate the athletes uh, or, or the public in general that these fat-soluble antioxidants and these water-soluble antioxidants are fighting against different kinds of free radicals in different parts of the body, so you want to have them both. But from a, from a, from a product development or, a, or a, a technological perspective, how do you get those into the same product? Um, I, I can use an example from, from Monavi, the company that I work for. We have, a, we have a juice that's high in flavonoids, we and we add carotenoids to it separately. So we extract them separately, and then we add them back in a way that is, that is appropriate for that product. You know? So it's a way that we can deliver both of those to the athletes at the same time. I, th I think the, the one way we are looking at it is to, uh, is to put all this in what, what we would generally term as a double-phased uh, capsule. Uh, that's got to be doubled. And that's a, and, and, and yeah, and that would be another approach as well. I agree with you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, very nice talk.